Our gracious Heavenly Father, I praise you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast together upon the truth of thy precious word. I ask that the Holy Spirit just take this time and that he strip away that which is error, sealing to our hearts that which is truth. We long to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Oh, dear Lord, allow truth to grip our hearts. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians verse by verse. And in our last study, we were in the area of verse 20 of chapter 1 that it was through the blood of Christ's cross that we were reconciled unto God and that we had no part in that at all. We didn't reconcile ourselves unto God by anything that we did. Verse 21 and 22 make it absolutely clear that we were at one time alienated and enemies in our minds by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We didn't make ourselves holy. We did not make ourselves blameless. Nor did we make ourselves unreprovable in his sight. The word unreprovable means that we would be approved in a court of law, found without charge. And that is how every one of you stand before God. Every true Christian stands before God. And we come to verse 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and we have seen that what is normally considered to be the the bastion of Arminian theology is in fact a strong statement of our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that in this video I am able to convince you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is not a conditional clause. It's not God will do something if we do something. It is much more grander than that. I don't think that we should lose sight of what this passage here, folks, is saying, that the God of all creation became incarnate in human flesh, that he might in fact become our kinsman and thereby purchase our redemption, that we were totally depraved, absolutely unable to help ourselves in any way to remedy our lost condition. And in that state of being alienated from God, and enemies of his, not working and not seeking after God, not seeking righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ died in our place. Where that we now stand before God holy and unblameable and unreprovable. And now we come to the 23rd verse, and it is a first class condition with the indicative mood, the mood of reality. Since you absolutely continue in the faith, and you will, not your trust in Him, but in His faithfulness, He is the God who placed within you a new life that cannot sin. It doesn't have the ability to sin, for His seed remains in you, and that new creation cannot sin. He who is absolutely faithful is the one who is promising your continuance. God who is faithful in this verse is the one who is promising you your continuance. It is a verse of comfort, not a verse of worry, and not a, a verse of concern. Now your relationship to God may in the area of fellowship be one that's topsy-turvy but positionally you are his and the God who absolutely takes care of you, who provides for you over and over again, the God who cannot lie, 
has made clear to you your security and your steadfastness is based upon what He did. I've talked about the first class condition before. I want to give you an example of this. I hope to, to be able to, to simplify this. If I could get you to, to take a look at Luke chapter 4, verse 3. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Now, there was no question in Satan's mind who Jesus was. First class condition, since thou be the Son of God. Now, what makes the word if here a first class condition is that it is followed by the indicative mood of certainty. Jesus was the Son of God. If you be the Son of God, and you are, Satan knew that he was. And furthermore, when, when we have a number of other verses which confirm the certainty of some particular truth, the, then the first class condition is only reinforced. Now, this is something that most first year uh, Greek Bible college students understand. In other words, if the word was to not declare with all certainty that Jesus was God, it would be the subjunctive mood of uncertainty. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. And we would have to translate the verse if as if. And context is also a determining factor. It may appear to be a first class condition until following verses prove it not to be. You'll, you'll note that in some cases that that will occur and it is of supreme importance and i can't i can't underemphasize the fact that it is of supreme importance that we ask the simple question who is the text speaking to and if you answer that question honestly it is speaking to us the very epistle folks opens up with statements that make it absolutely clear that he's speaking to believers, not to non-believers. So here's what we're being shown. Since you continue in the faith, having been grounded, and it is addressing one who has been grounded, it's a perfect tense indicating that this is perfectly done, completely done, and that it was in fact done in past time. And we, we cannot put time in the aorist tense, but in the perfect tense. This is something that was done in past time, and we are looking at the present reality of a past completed action. We're looking at the present reality of a past completed action. You were grounded. The passive voice clearly says that you did not do it. God did it. Now, you may not understand it. You may not even have comprehended it, but God did. Uh, he certainly comprehended it. He wrote it. God did it. He completely did it. And we are looking at the present reality of what He has completely done. Having been grounded and firm, that is stable, steadfast. It's an adjective. It's a solid founding and grounding. It's not shaky. It cannot be shaken and not moved away from the gospel's hope. Folks, this is a genitive. The gospel's hope. It belongs to the gospel. The hope belongs to the gospel. Removed from one to the other. It's not your hope in the gospel. It's the gospel's certainty. So we have a genuine first class condition. You are not moved away from the certainty of the good news. And the good news was not synergistic news. God did not say, if, 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 then I will, 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 will. That is not the message of the gospel. It is without question the primary message that you'll hear proclaimed today. Millions of Christians who are absolutely provided for in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ are growing old. 
never knowing it, never comprehending it, burdened with an area of responsibility that the Holy Spirit never intended that they bear. The world is full of despair, despondency, mental disturbances, depression. Great numbers of those people are professing Christians. Now hear me out, please. I'm not saying that all of these are there because of humanism and legalism. Not at all. If our enemy, the devil, is able to assign 6,000 demons to one man in Gadara, just one man, then imagine what he may have assigned to you. I'm not certain we sometimes take, as we should, the glimpses God gives us into the spirit world that surrounds us. I'm not in any way sympathizing with the spiritists, not at all. But listen, I believe in a personal devil. It's not just uh, an evil influence in the world today. Our enemy, the devil, a personal enemy with a tremendous host of demons is interested not in putting us in hell. I'm absolutely persuaded that he knows that he can't do that. But there is nothing, folks, there is nothing that he would rather see than you discouraged, despondent, and not trusting the Savior. And I believe that that is his work. I remind you, I've pointed this out in the past, I remind you again, Eve said to Satan, this is what God said, and Satan said, that's not true. When Satan tested Job, did, did Satan want Job to sin? No. I mean, well, depending on how you use the word sin. If he wanted him to sin, all he needed was a belly dancer from Damascus. He could have done that very easily. Wouldn't have done him any good. What he wanted Job to do was to not trust God, to deny God. And the word die is there in the text. Not that Job would go to hell, but that he would be out of fellowship, out of trusting, out of rest, out of peace with God. And I know that your enemy wants that. I'm persuaded that the closer that you decide that you want to walk to the truth of this book, then the greater is the tribulation, the pressure. The lipsis is the word, pressure. And so I'm certain that many who suffer these areas of conflict suffer them because of, of 6,000 demons or, or whatever. Whatever it is that Satan has chosen to assign to you. I am comforted as I read the, the word that Elijah was able to comprehend that they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I'm persuaded that if Satan has assigned 6,000 demons to you, well, God may have well assigned 12,000. I don't know, but I do know it was not one demon that harassed the maniac of Gadara, but 6,000 of them. However, I am certain from my walk through this life that many a Christian is confused, uncertain, despondent, unthankful, and lacking in joy and comfort because, because, He's never comprehended the truth of a sovereign and a powerful God, a all, an all-loving, all-sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing God. They've been raised in humanism and legalism, and human merit has evaluated their production and their effort against those that they see around them. And so they slip into despondency and despair. Or they, or they tragically, they've become content in finding comfort in a whole lot of lies. Oh, dear friends, there is no program. There is no excitement. There's no enthusiasm that can hold one tiny candle beside the truth of the Word of God. Christians today, they seem to have the idea that the true Christian life is a is a mountaintop experience of victory after victory after victory when it's a walk of faith, of trust in one who never fails, despite the fact that we do, who has completely provided 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. Don't worry about anything. In everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I light your candle. I bottle your tears. I branded your name on the palm of my hand. I know the way that you take. And when I've tested you, you will come forth as gold. You will come forth as gold. We do not have here, folks, in verse 23, a verse that burdens, but a truth in which we can rejoice. How do I know that I was reconciled when Jesus Christ died in my place and rose from the dead? I can know because I have the certainty of continuance and the certainty of, of the gospel's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is inconceivable to me that the human mind, and in the main they do, most of the Christians you know read our present text as though verse 23 is true if you complete, or verse 23 is, is true if you complete verse 22. To me, it's, it's sad that it's most of the Christians that I know. If, if I could go back 400 years in church history without question, the majority, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of Christians took this statement of faith exactly as it's written. You are now reconciled since you continue in the faith. Your reconciliation, folks, is not based upon your continuance. Your continuance is based upon your reconciliation. And just like every, everything else, it seems, modern Christianity has gotten the cart before the horse, put the cart before the horse. It's exact, Satan has, has reversed it. He's a master at that. He loves to do that. Your reconciliation is not based upon your work. Your continuance is based upon the work of Christ. And 90% or more of professing Christianity believed that. Today, without any question, 90% of professing Christianity believes just the opposite that my reconciliation is based upon my continuance. And the text, folks, does not say that. The text can't say that. First of all, the text is a love letter written to you. Okay? God has you in mind when He's writing this. When did... When did God reconcile you in the body of His flesh? Through death. I mean, are you suggesting to me that Jesus Christ dies every time someone accepts Christ? Or do, you, or do you realize that you are the sheep of His pasture? That you are His family, His household, His people, and that in the body of His flesh, through death, once and only once, in that He died, He died unto sin once and only once, says Romans 3. That is when you are reconciled. It isn't when you knew about it, but it's when you were reconciled. And the certainty of that, the certainty of that, the certainty of, of continuance, your continuance, is the certainty of your reconciliation. The certainty of your reconciliation is the resurrection of Christ. Romans chapter 4, He was delivered because of your offenses and He was raised again because you were made righteous. And when God made you righteous, you are righteous. What God does, He does completely, as the Scriptures say. And what He does, He does forever. The text is not saying that you were reconciled when Christ died. If... You do certain things, but rather that certain things are the inevitable result of what was accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
so easy to say that I believe God became incarnate in human flesh, suffered on the cross, died, and was buried, and rose again on the third day. But those words, folks, are fraught with theological importance and spiritual meaning. Can any one of us in any way grasp the reality that the Almighty, eternal God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the majestic God of all creation who hung the stars in the sky, became incarnate in human flesh, that God dwelt among us. Can we even understand in the smallest way what must be involved in the infinite deity tabernacling among men? Is it conceivable that we could comprehend what it means to be so brutally disfigured at the hands of a world that he's spoken to existence that he could have squashed out of existence with one wave of his hand? I mean, the foolishness of these creatures saying, you know, come down, if you're God, come down from the cross, if you are in fact God. And today I hear men and women say, I don't believe in a God. There can't be any God. Millions of people are starving. People are despitefully used. There are wealthy people trampling on poor people with no concern. The world's just full of hatred and strife and violence. You know, even if there is a God, and I don't think there is, but even if there was, He doesn't care. Now my heart aches over that. How can you say God doesn't care when He became incarnate in human flesh, suffered and died for, for us, died in our place? I cannot imagine a greater expression of this love, the incarnation, the death on the cross, and His being made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I'm persuaded that none of us can begin to comprehend the magnitude of all that, and yet I live in a world where that at least 99 Christians out of 100 say that His dying for me is not enough. I have to do something. He paid a hundred billion dollars, billion dollars, but I got to put in my quarter, or the whole hundred billion is down the sewer. Come on. Most of your Christian friends today have pushed to the wall. Do not believe that Jesus Christ did enough. There's more that must be done. He made it possible, but you've got to make it factual. And folks, that is not true. It wasn't true in God's dealing with Israel, and it is not true in your life. It is not you who made certain what God did in Christ, but it is God who made certain what God did in Christ. And the Almighty Sovereign God is not unwilling to say to you, you will continue in the faith, not yours but His. You will not be moved away from the certainty of the hope, the certainty of the good news. It's man who has said the good news is if, and it is God who says the good news is. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I've not earned one bit of merit with God. There's nothing in me which compelled God to do something for me that He did not do or could not do for others. I am persuaded that God has revealed in His Word that He gets from us exactly what He expected, and that is total abject failure. And I praise God that my oneness with Him is not based upon my faithfulness, my production my belief or my service, but upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did on my behalf. I'm stunned. The percentage of Christians today who are willing, eager would be a better word, not only willing but eager to place their work beside the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the matter of redemption. Oh, they don't say it in so much language, you know, they're eager to admit that without Christ there would be no redemption, but they always throw in that, that, you know, without what they did, 
there wouldn't be any redemption. And then all of the infinitude of the incarnation, the magnitude of the vicarious suffering of our Savior is for nothing. I don't hear people talking about the marvelous and majestic person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the hope of the good news? The hope, the hope of the good news is God has done something and it's done. It is done. Christians have labeled me a heretic. They've gotten mad at me. There's one area where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm never to be invited back because I won't say that someone has to utter some formula or pre perform some act or make some decision to be redeemed. Oh, they're going to go to hell, Steve, if you don't get them to make a decision. They're going to go to hell if God doesn't make the decision. Which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, John 1.13. You are mine, says God. I have redeemed you, says the Lord. Dearly beloved, God saved millions of souls who never even heard the name of the name Jesus Christ. That is a fact. How does that fit into the human merit-based religious belief system? It doesn't. They don't have an answer for that. I don't care whether you make a decision or not. It'd help your life a whole lot if you did. Wonderful thing to walk trusting the Lord. How can there be? How can we have in the midst of all of life's problems a sense of confidence in our God if the certainty of our salvation depended upon something that we did or did not do or failed to do in view of all the pressures of life that we face? We let our requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes understanding guards our hearts. And I don't see a lot of that. I pray over and over again in my study, you know, what am I teaching? What is being said, Lord? I prefer to be struck dead than to teach error. I don't want to teach error. I want to teach the Word of God because I love Christ, because I want people to know that it's true. I want people to know what Christ has done for you. I hope and I pray, I constantly pray that everyone here studying the Word together through this channel knows what the hope of the Gospel is. You can pick up commentary after commentary. You can pick up commentaries written in the last 50 years that will tell you that that's your hope in the gospel. And I'm telling you that the grammar says what a simple genitive declares that that is to be gos the, the gospel's hope, not your hope in the gospel, but the certainty of what God has done. That is the heart of the good news. It's done. It's done. Your hope in the gospel may move away, but you cannot be moved away from the certainty of the good news. You are His and He is yours forever. We've been hearing a lot lately about quid pro quo. If you've been paying attention to cable news, you know, quid pro quo in politics, that's, it's a bad thing, you know. Unless you fire the one investigating my son, I'll, I'll withhold, you know, X amount of dollars in, in assistance or aid. But in religion, <laughs> uh, in religion, in the world religious system based on human merit, quid pro quo is an awesome thing. God is considered to be quid pro quo personified. Unless you do something for me, I'll send you to hell. I hereby coin the term quid pro quo Christianity. It's a form, folks. It's a form of blackmail. Blackmail Christianity. I want to thank you all for your continued interest in these studies. I thank you for all of your prayers. I'm feeling much better. 
I ask for your continued prayers for myself and this ministry and for Sue. I thank you for all of your support, all of your messages, all of your emails. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.